Today, we're going to be looking at the history behind something you probably see every single day and is necessary to society functioning normally, but which you probably take for granted, the humble traffic light. A traffic control, which is of course what a traffic light functions as, already existed in the Roman world, believe it or not. The number of vehicles allowed in cities was even regulated. For example, in the year just before his assassination, Julius Caesar, of all people, decided to pass laws tackling traffic congestion in the city of Rome by limiting the number of wheeled vehicles that could enter it, with the exception of vehicles carrying the sacred Vestal Virgins. The Romans also came up with one-way streets, parking laws, road crossings, and traffic circles. But with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire and the beginning of the Middle Ages, traffic levels plummeted, which, now that I think of it, I, I don't think most would consider a bad thing. Uh, presumably, this was with the decline of urban centers. Traffic levels, however, began to rise again in the 18th and 19th centuries, so before the advent of the modern car. And even though it sounds somewhat implausible, the traffic signal also emerged before the car. So here is its story. The traffic signal was first invented in 1868 by a railway manager named John Peak Knight. This truly revolutionary innovator was born in Nottingham in 1828 and already by the age of 12 had dropped out of grammar school and had gone to work in the mailroom of a railway. Somehow by the age of 25 he'd gone from working in a railway's mailroom to being the superintendent of a whole railway and he became one of the first people to utilize emergency brake cords in trains. He specialized in creating signaling systems, so as an innovative man, he decided that it, if they could be used to control trains, they could surely be used to control the horse-drawn traffic of his day. In 1865, he first brought the idea of using railway signaling on the streets of London to the commissioner of London's Metropolitan Police, as the growing number of horse-drawn carriages endangered pedestrians. Instead of just continuously piling underground and overground railways on top of each other to facilitate traffic, which was, of course, the norm then, he believed a regular stream of traffic could be achieved along busy roads through creating stricter rules for traffic. This would then make traveling the streets safer for pedestrians by adding intervals for pedestrian crossings, and it would make it safer for horse-drawn traffic because they wouldn't be crashing into each other all the time now. When the time came for the first ever traffic light to be physically constructed, however, it was built by the engineering firm Saxby and Farmer, but it was still most definitely Knight's idea. Since the overflow of horse-drawn traffic over Westminster Bridge compelled thousands to walk next to the Houses of Parliament, this is where the first ever traffic signal was erected. So what did it look like? Well, it was a 22-foot tall pole facing three streets, Bridge Street, Great George Street, and Parliament Street, so it had three semaphore arms operated by a police constable. What are semaphore arms, you ask? Well, they were these things that swung out horizontally. And when they did so, traffic was meant to stop. When the arms swung back to a 45 degree angle, traffic was meant to proceed. This semaphore system was substituted by red and green gaslit lanterns at night, which were manually turned by a police constable with a lever in order for the lanterns to face the right ways at the right times. Much like today's traffic lights, green meant go, and red meant stop. But surprisingly enough, the usage of red and green for similar purposes predates this early traffic signal, and even the railway signals it was based off of, because the railway signals themselves were inspired by maritime signals, which in turn came from lighthouses. What a world. For a month, this, glo for a month, this gloriously groundbreaking invention was a success, with Knight foreseeing that more of them would soon be installed all around central London. But tragedy struck the fledgling project when on one fateful day, the 2nd of January 1869, it exploded, badly burning the policemen operating it. Well, it was actually a series of gas explosions that occurred due to a leak in one of the mains beneath the pavement, and as such, the project was soon dropped. Mr. Knight would live on until 1886, but traffic signals would enter a dark age from which they wouldn't emerge for four more decades. 
That's because the rise of traffic lights was a result of the rapid rise of another new innovation, automobiles, and the huge amounts of congestion they soon created. After Henry Ford came out with the first car affordable and reliable enough for mass commuting, the famous Model T in 1908, and then started mass producing it in 1913, there was an explosion of urban traffic. New York City, for instance, began experiencing twice daily traffic jams, which I'm sure is way better than today, and Chicago's trolley companies claimed they had to go slower than their horse-drawn predecessors. Just to demonstrate how insanely rapid the adoption of the car was in the states, the number of automobiles in San Francisco surpassed the number of horse-drawn vehicles there in 1914, understandably, but by 1916, just two years later, there were well over two times more cars than horse-drawn vehicles, and eight years later, there were ten times more. Between 1904 and 1917, traffic on 5th Avenue in NYC grew at two times the rate of the city's population. And in other cities, there were similar and even more extreme figures, like in St. Louis, where traffic grew at nine times the, the rate of the city's population. Major European cities, on the other hand, were spared traffic jams until the mid-20s, since cars were more expensive there and imported fuel was heavily taxed. Since traffic was a more pressing concern in America, that would be where the traffic light would mature. American innovators took the lead in creating automated traffic lights, especially since it was just impossible for the cops to keep up with all the traffic. Semaphore signals, like the one employed by night, were first adopted in the U.S. in Toledo, Ohio in 1908. Mid-intersection towers with police stationed within them were also employed, and that method of controlling traffic was first tried out in NYC in 1915. Both types of traffic control would disappear by the 30s, however, since, as I'm sure you can imagine, the mid-intersection towers just obstructed traffic, and despite the gaslit lanterns they featured, semaphores just weren't visible enough at night. Various American innovators took the lead in creating automated traffic lights. The first of the innovators I mentioned is a man named Ernest Serin of Chicago, who patented an automatic traffic signal system in April of 1910, which featured two turning, non-illuminated display arms emblazoned with the words, Stop and Proceed. Pretty simple. Next up was Lester Farnsworth Wire of Utah, who in 1912 created the first electric traffic light. Like Knight's gaslit signal, it also employed red and green lights. It was powered by trolley wires that ran over it, but a police officer was needed to operate it, manually switching the direction of the lights. Right after that, in 1913, Cleveland's James Hoag patented a manually controlled signal that featured the words stop and move, illuminated by electricity. In August of 1914, the first permanent traffic control lights were installed at the four corners of 105th Street and Euclid Avenue in Cleveland, and they had been designed by James Hoag. They were 15 feet off the ground, and bells on them would ring once to let the cars on one street know they could proceed, and twice to let the cars on the other street know that they could proceed. A police officer still had to operate them, though, from the sidewalk, partially because it was thought that the traffic signals would be ignored without the cops standing by, and additionally, it was hoped that the rhythm of traffic could be changed by that officer to let police and firefighters through more easily. Two years later, a man named William Giglieri in 1917 created a traffic light that switched between being manually and automatically controlled. Then in... Then in 1920, Detroit policeman William Potts invented the first ever automatic overhanging system, also the first to have three lenses, but never patented his invention for unknown reasons. He also came up with yet another groundbreaking innovation, the yellow light, which was invented so that intersections could clear up between light changes. The color yellow was chosen for the job because it has pretty high visibility, which is a pretty good thing when you need a huge hunk of metal hurtling towards an intersection to suddenly stop. 
Garrett Morgan, a Kentucky-born African-American businessman, patented his affordable T-shaped manual system in the U.S., the U.K., and even up here in Canada in 1923. It was lit by electricity and had a caution signal that wasn't exactly a yellow light, but pretty much acted as one. Because of how cheap it was, it became the standard form of traffic light until the automatic three-light system used now was adopted. Visibility was later improved by adding hoods to the lights and sandblasting the lenses. So now back to the traffic lights general history. Manually controlled traffic lights were embraced by New York City and Chicago by 1918 and major European cities began adopting them in the 20s. And automatic signals were available by 1922 since signals controlled by automatic timers had been invented that year by railway signal firm Krauss Heinz and brought out in Houston where it was based. This was thanks to the advancements made in signaling technology resulting from the First World War, when automatic timers for military communications had been developed. But this didn't stop American and European cities from employing lights that had to be operated by police, since they thought the signals would be ignored without police presence. However, automatic lights began spreading rapidly. They were adopted in NYC and LA in 1924, and all major American cities followed suit. NYC, for instance, went from having 98 in 1926 to having 2,243 just a few years later in 1928. Or a couple years later, rather. New traffic lights in New York City in the 20s were the impetus of neighborhood celebrations because pedestrians had been stripped of their right-of-way except at intersections. And pedestrians, of course, had enjoyed their right-of-way for the vast majority of history, so this was a big shock for them. One source I read even implies that the game Red Light, Green Light may have been invented to teach kids about when they had the right of way because unfortunately most victims of this then new traffic system were children. Trolley companies funded the installation of a lot of these traffic lights since they distrusted the judgment of individual cops and most of the public felt the same way. London first installed automatic lights in 1931, sooner than any other city in Europe. Automatic traffic lights, of course, replaced traffic police, who were much more expensive to maintain and could mostly be reassigned, although using automatic lights did necessitate employing professional electricians to maintain them. Interestingly enough, these first traffic signals may have actually worsened driver safety since drivers became overconfident and cities adopted the so-called platoon system, where all the lights on major streets would change together, which of course made drivers want to get past as many green lights as possible before having to stop. The staggered system of, of signals, which maximized traffic mobility, were then introduced, and through trial and error, were gradually improved. Soon enough, traffic control had become a mathematical discipline. The first staggered light systems were installed by General Electric on 16th Street in Washington, D.C. in 1926, and after having reportedly doubled commuting speed there, most major cities adopted them within two years, and the first staggered light system was introduced to somewhere as far as Tokyo just a few years after that. And surprisingly enough, that pretty much takes us to today, because traffic engineers had created a large professional community for themselves by 1930, and traffic light systems became pretty much uniform across the world after that. Just as an example, in 1923, so granted a few years before, engineers realized that it would be impossible for 10% of the adult male population, i.e. men with color blindness, to follow traffic signals. But because the meaning of the red and green lights had been instilled in drivers for years already at that point, a proposed alternative featuring yellow and blue was dropped, despite it actually being a superior alternative. So if you take anything away from this video, it should be that in a timeline not too dissimilar to ours, we could have had yellow and blue instead of red and green. And that's the history behind the traffic light. Thank you so much for watching and make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to see more content just like this, then just check out my first video on toilet paper, which I have personally dubbed the traffic light of the bathroom. Because you see them everywhere, but probably take them for granted.